So coach, Romeo Cornell, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Cal. Appreciate you having me. It's been a pleasure getting to know you a little bit over all these years. And um, you're so widely and so highly regarded throughout the league. Um, can you tell us where you started and how many years? Because it's a quite a stretch run. And also drop a little hint about how many rings you have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I started um, in Lynchburg, Virginia, outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, in Amherst County. And uh, we lived in the county. Um, my father is the military man. He was in the Army. And um, we started off, he was gone. I think it was toward the, uh, I was born in 47, so it was toward the end of uh, World War II. And uh, I know he mentioned that uh, he had to take the, the ship to Africa. And uh, he was talking about being seasick and all of that. Uh, so he caught the tail end of World War II. But while he was gone, we lived with my grandparents on my mother's side. And there were, they had nine kids. And uh, the two males, they were kind of off on their own. They'd, they were old enough that they'd gotten jobs and they were working. Um, and all the ladies were still in the same house with, with uh, grandmother and, and grand, granddad. He worked for the railroad. Um, somehow or other, and I, I don't know how, but he had 16 acres of land. And so um, there was some farming that had to be done. Uh, there were some uh, hogs. Uh, he had a mule, um, chickens. And, uh, you know, and then on the land, uh, would take the timber off the land, you know, for the stove and all of that. Um, started out, we didn't have running water. He had to go to the spring uh, to get water. Um, had an outhouse. Um, and so that was, you know, a pretty humble beginning. Um, but then when my dad came back, um, he ended up building a house um, not far from the grandparents. And he and his father, um, they built it together. And, and so uh, that was home. And Every time the Army wanted us to move, which was generally about every three years, uh, you go, you pa you'd pack up and go. And uh, so we would do that. And then when he got stationed overseas, again, we went back home uh, at that time. So um, that was my beginning. And, and during that beginning, um, being in the county, when you went to town, which was Lynchburg, you had to take the bus to go to town and you had to ride the back of the bus. That was, mm. that was it, yeah. you know. Um, trying to go to the bathroom, if there was not a black bathroom available, you just didn't go to the bathroom. But you had to deal with it because that's what it was, you know. Um, and in, it was hard to change. And it really, change has been slow coming but there has been some change over time. But when you think back about when it all started, which was over 400 years ago, and, and the black people that came to America were, were slaves. And so basically they were second class citizens. Um, and they did all the menial chores, the work in the field and all of those things. Um, and they were owned by slave owners. Um, and as a result of that second class citizenship, all right, even after the emancipation, they were still looked at as second class citizens. Um, and as a result of being slaves, not having financial means to do what they needed to do, they became sharecroppers, which then the, the guy who owned the land, he was still in control, you know, uh, at that time. And so the black population has, has gone through slavery, um, the Jim Crow era in the South particularly, segregation, um, separate but equal, uh, I mean, a lot of things. But, you know, like uh, Dr. Cornell West said, uh, we still survive. And, uh, 
and he was mentioning that he was optimistic about what's happening today, that it has a different feel. And, um, and, and I feel that it has a different feel, you know, this time. Um, because when I saw what they did to George Floyd, um, it hurt my heart. Uh, it, it really did. And then I also think that it hurt the hearts of a lot of other people that were watching. You know, uh, why a policeman, a former policeman, who has the power, who has control, handcuffs a guy with his hands behind his back, and then sits there with his knee on his neck when he was telling him he can't breathe and his hurt chest is hurting. And so I said to myself, what made this guy do that? Um, and, and so I think that he felt an entitlement um, that whatever he did, there would be no consequences for him. You know, this is just a black person. And, and so any human being probably would not have done that. So I, I don't think the guy, I think he's basically heartless. That's, that's in my mind, that he's heartless for doing what he did. But I think he did what he did because he felt entitled. He didn't feel like that anybody would do anything to him. But see, you have to understand that the people were there, they had cameras, and, and he knew that they were filming him. It's in broad daylight, you know, and he knew he was being filmed, and still that didn't slow him down at all, oh. all right? And then the people who were there, they have to deal with the police. There were four of them. Oh. So the police are taught, if you try to get into their business, then they're gonna retaliate, you know? And so all the people could do is say, hey, he can't breathe. He's dying, stop you know, it. get off, stop, yeah, stop. Oh, yeah. get off of him, yeah. you know, but that didn't work, you know, that didn't work, unfortunately. So part of it was the act and, and the officer, it's like he didn't have a heart, like you said. Yeah. So wonderfully. And, but then the other part of it is what you've seen over the years is a lack of consequences or justice for that. Well, right. The lack of consequences, the lack of justice, as you say, and then it's been going on for so long. It's been going on for a long time. You know, uh, it used to be that in the dark of night, then the dirty deeds were done. But now people have become emboldened to do it in the daylight without any really threat of consequence. You know, because the Georgia situation where, where the young man was running down the street and they trapped him and had the guns and ended up shooting. Shot the guy three times, you know? Yeah, shot him three times, you know? And, and then in Louisville, Kentucky, and I, and I think about Louisville because my wife, she's from Louisville. They got a no-knock warrant and they break into the house and then they just kill the woman, you know? She doesn't know who's coming in the door. And so they got a no-knock warrant. Then they claim that they identified themselves. Well, if you're going to identify yourself, you don't need a no-knock warrant, you know, but boom, you know, and so I think black people, they look at this and they know that it's happening and been happening over the years and it has it's slowly gotten better. But I think this time, because of the way it happened and why it happened the way it did, that so many people were watching and so many people are infuriated um, by the act that when you looked at the protest, the diversity of the protest, mm -hmm. the number across this country and also in the world. In the worldwide. Yeah, and so as a result, conversations are developing about racism. And so something has to be done about the policing. And I think our mayor, he said yesterday that he's gonna do something about it. And I think we've got to help him, you know, to, to make it better. But then it goes back 400 years because it's hard for the black population to overcome what occurred 400 years ago and then what's been happening ever since. What you try to do is you try to do the best you can, 
Like my father was in the army and he was a sergeant and he ran our house like he would run a platoon, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I always felt a responsibility to him and to his job, his standing, because he's working for the government. Mm -hmm. It's the army. And, and so you, I never really wanted to do anything that hurt him, you know, in any way. Um, and so when I got my first job at Western Kentucky, that was my first real job, you know, that paid a salary and all of that. My thought was knowing the lay of the land and what black people have to deal with, I felt like that I needed to be an example that I needed to be on my P's and Q's all the time to give other black people who come along an opportunity. Because uh, this is in uh, 70, I was the only black coach on the staff. I was the first black coach, mm -hmm. all right? And the only one on the staff. And so you had to be better. Exactly. And that's been said many times in the black population that a black person has to be twice as good, all right, to, to compete and to have a chance to, for upward mobility. Um, and so I felt like that I had to be on top of my game, no trouble any kind of way, all right? And sometimes that's not easy because you could be riding down the street and you get pulled over just for being black and riding down the street. So did that happen to you? Did you have any of those experiences? It wasn't a negative experience, but it was an experience that uh, in Jersey, I was going home one night and then I got pulled over, but he was professional and you know asked for the driver's license and all that and take a look at it and then he let me go. But still the anxiety that's occurring inside by being pulled over because you don't know what's gonna happen. And there was no reason to pull you over. No, Yeah. there was none, there was none. And then I think about trying to make things better for my kids who are adults right now and for my grandkids because they are the future and they're gonna to have to live in the world. And then also I think about these players that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, any one of them could have been George Floyd very easily, mm -hmm. you know? And so that scares you. And that's why it's so important that we try to get something done now because five years from now, it's not gonna be, if you have to wait five years for it to happen, all right, sometimes things get swept under the rug. The fire is hot right now, so boom, having conversations. And I think that there are more conversations about race on television that I've been seeing. And, and so if we talk about it more and be honest about what's happening, I think everybody will have a chance to see and understand why some of the things are happening and then be ready to make a change. And so changing the police policies, that's a step in the right direction. And then also understanding that the black race has been at the bottom of the totem pole for 400 years and that's not gonna change overnight, all right? But if we get everybody doing a little bit positive change, positive work, now then we can make that change, you know? And, and hopefully it will not be another 400 years um, of the same old, same old. Because in the black population, that's what it seems like it is. It's the same old, same old. And, and they talk about Emmett Till who was hung and, and his mom wanted an open casket so that they could see what was done to her son, okay? But then still here in 2020, we got a guy being killed in open daylight, you know? And, and so something is wrong somewhere. So it has, to, it has to be fixed. And the sooner we can fix it, I think the better off the world will be, mm -hmm. the country will be. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm encouraged because of the diversity of the marchers. I, I'm encouraged by the spread of the protest all over the world, all right? I'm encouraged by the fact that they are still marching. I mean, it's been 15 days and they're still marching and, and protesting and drawing attention to the fact that change needs to occur. Um, and so 
then we have to do everything we can to, to help that change occur. You know, and, and having conversations like this, and, and one of the reasons that we're having it is because I think that you listen. Uh, from our time together, I think that you'll listen and, and you'll take what's said and go back and evaluate. And then if we can influence the people of power, all right, to do a little something, all right, then that's going to help everybody. Yeah, we need to vote and get the people in that are going to make the changes that are necessary or the people in there need to make the changes necessary in the laws, in the police force. And if they don't, we need to go vote and get folks who will and make these changes. Exactly. And, and you know, one of the things, you know, a lot of times we vote in the big elections, president, right. you know, and that. But everybody says, particularly I listened to... Um, President Obama, he was talking about, it's the local elections. Mm -hmm. you, we it need to effect. vote mm -hmm. in those so that we can get the right people in, in mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. who can change, you know, who can make some changes. And so I think you're right. I think you're right. Well, I think we hit an inflection point with George Floyd. And it's, it's horrible what happened. But if we take that and make a huge change that makes so much benefit, that would really be, you yeah. know, something that honoring his honoring memory. Honoring his, yes, his memory. Yes, that's and the his right name. way to do. Yeah. yeah. We, so we get we owe it to him to mm -hmm. do that. I think in addition to police, I mean, we have to think about how our kids are being educated, what they're being taught in books, and about history. Mm -hmm. And I think that for the future, we need to make sure they're being taught the right thing, because I think it, if you're talking systemic, it it's broad. Sure, it's really you, broad. I mean, and if we can start in our local elections with the education and um, HISD and who, who will help us get to that point where all of our children are being taught equal, true equality and then also the history of how we got here and the true history. Mm -hmm. I, I think that one of the things that has made that difficult over time is because the slaves, they didn't want the slaves to be educated because if they knew how to read, they would whip them or they would kill them. And so they didn't want them to be educated. And so they tried to keep the black population uneducated so that they could keep working and, and continue to be slaves. Um, but systemically, okay, some of that attitude has gone over these 400 years, all right, separate but equal. Well, it was separate, but it ne wasn't necessarily equal. And financially, that becomes an issue, you know, like public school versus private school. Well, a lot of the public schools, they got a lot of kids, they don't have quite the money, all right, and so their education is not quite as good, all right, the teachers don't make as much. Uh, and so all of those things have to be fixed at some point, all right, but it's not gonna happen overnight. But as long as we understand where the problem lies, okay, and that if we can get better education, all right, better housing, all right, you know, and better attitudes toward each other, then that'll be a good first step. You know, and along with the policing, because see the thing about the policing, that's something that's tangible right now. Right now, all right, right now that everybody knows that if, if we can just fix that one thing, all right, we're gonna save some lives. All right, and I'm not saying that all police are bad. No. I, I know that okay. that's not the case. Yeah. All right, but if you can fix the policing, like eliminating the chokehold, well, then we're gonna have fewer deaths by Choco, you know, uh, so so you got to start with strike while the fire is hot. Strike while you know? the fire is hot. So that, that's what we're trying to do and that's why we're having the conversation. It's a big broad picture that 400 years, you know, in the making and so, but if, if we work together and everybody does something a little positive, then we can, we can move it. We'll get better. We are going to work. We will. That's Get better. Better. You lived in Mississippi during an interesting time. Of course. I hurt just a little bit. 
but can you tell us a little bit about that experience for you? Well, being in athletics, athletics is one of the things that has allowed black men and also black women to have that social mobility, all right, because of the skills and all of that. Well, when I first went to Mississippi, it was in uh, 78, okay? And I told my wife, I said, mm, they're still a little behind here, you know, because I was out of Texas Tech. That's where I was. I was coaching at Texas Tech at the time. Steve, you were there before Texas Tech and then Mississippi? Then went to Mississippi. Okay. Steve Sloan was the head coach at Steve Tech. Steve Sloan, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Steve took a job at, at Ole Miss. And then we went down for a recruiting weekend, all right, to look at the school and lay of the land. And so I got back and I told her, I said, it's a little different. They're still, they're still not caught up to the times, you know. And I told her it was similar to when I went to Western Kentucky uh, that I was, what, the third black player on the football team uh, at Western. And so Western is... They're still in the South, okay? And so uh, I said, well, it's like when we first went to Western. I said, if you don't want to do that, we'll stay at, at Lubbock. We'll stay here because we kind of enjoyed Lubbock. Um, and, and the people in Lubbock were, were good. We enjoyed the people, our neighbors and first real house and all that good stuff. So I told her, I said, maybe a little rough. She says, well, I'm ready for a change and let's go. So we go, and they had a luncheon for the coaches' wives, and all the coaches' wives were invited except my wife. Oh. And so mm. that broke her heart mm -hmm. there. Did you have kids in this time? Oh, yeah. So were your kids, did your kids experience this as well? You know, your wife didn't get invited to a luncheon, and your kids were, they treated the same? Well, the kids were, yeah, most of the time the kids were treated like kids. Kids, kids, they don't know any better to start mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. They are taught, right? you know, they are taught. Uh, and, and one of the things that happened is, I don't remember which child it was, because I got three girls, okay? And uh, my wife, I came home one day and my wife tells me the teacher from school called her. It says we're in Mississippi, and uh, and I said, well, what's the problem? She said, my daughter was holding hands with a white boy, and that was a problem, and we don't do that here. And so that, I mean, you know, she was a young, I mean, really young, you know, and young kids are innocent. Yeah. That's what they are. And so at school, she was holding hands with a white boy, and you can't do that. And so it was it was it wasn't the easiest time. It wasn't the easiest two years. You know. I'm glad you got out of there. Well, me too. <laughs> it, it worked out pretty good. You know. It worked out good. We're so blessed you're in Houston. Well, Just, I am also. Yeah. It's been very good. It's been very good. So, you know, we just you try to keep doing the right thing, mm -hmm. you know. And and for me, part of the reward for doing the right thing is when some of the young black coaches who are in the league now, they call me and tell me or meet me and tell me that they appreciate the image that I've set for them. Um, and so that, that gives me, makes me feel good gives me hope about our people getting opportunities and if we can get opportunities and and basically that's that's all we want we want to be treated equally and given opportunities and then let our abilities take over from there you know whether they're mental abilities or physical abilities but but that's all we've ever wanted but it's just been hard it's hard to get there you know and, and maybe someday. Well, you have been a real trailblazer, and you've seen so much change from your childhood. I mean, my gosh, growing up where you didn't have running water, yeah. and you're in an outhouse. Yeah. I mean, and 
I mean, the, the back the, of the bus and back you're of the bus and bathrooms. no bathrooms. And I mean, um, the change is just what you've seen over your your span has just been amazing. And hopefully, we're getting better. Yeah, but we still have a long ways to go. Well, that's right. You know, we still have a long ways to go. But if if we can continue the conversations. Uh, you know, and be truthful and all of that, then we got a chance to make it there. Like I said, I'm very hopeful because of what I've seen about the demonstrations um, and the marches. Um, I'm hopeful, mm -hmm. but I might not hold my breath, you know, until, until I can see the tangible evidence that things are changing. When you live it, you know, it, it's hard to, to say different, um, but because that's the way it's been. And when protest, when protest first started, it was primarily black people that were protesting. Um, and then when the protest itself didn't get anything done, then they started rioting, looting, and burning, okay, to try to get attention, to say we are serious about this. All right, and still that didn't get much done. Um, but the protests this time because of George, they were, they were different. I know there was some rioting and there was some looting and, and all of that, but the majority of the people were protesting what happened to George. And so um, I think that the dialogue is going to continue. I think that there are going to be some tangible changes, particularly like, like Mayor Turner, those things that he put out there were very tangible and things that can and help the community. And then if everybody else around the state sees that it's good, all right, then it'll spread to the state and to the country, you know, and, and then we'll get better. From our experience over this past six years, I felt like that it would be good to come to talk to you because I felt like that you were going to listen. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, how we all appreciate it. Um, uh, you're just a tremendous person, and we recognize that. And um, it's been a pleasure having you here six years and hopefully six more years. Is there anything else that you want us to hear? that um, you think maybe we need to hear or a challenge to us? Just make some things happen. I mean, that's it. If you guys will use your influence, because you're going to be rubbing elbows with influential people, and, and maybe just get them to understand that if we can help this way, we're helping the country, you know. Uh, we're making the world better. And, and, and that's what we want. I think all parents want the world to be better for their children and for their grandchildren, mm -hmm. you know? And so if we can do that, that's a tremendous plus, mm -hmm. tremendous plus.